Back when I was a wee lad, I used to watch my dad play some PS2 games, with the likes of Gran Turismo 3, GTA Vice City, some Cabela hunting games, and on today's case, Red Dead Revolver. Red Dead Revolver is a special case, besides the nostalgia and all my top 5 favorite PS2 gems. On the surface, it's your average third person shooter starring badass bounty hunter and facial scar enthusiast Red Harlow. Deep down, this game is the backbone, the foundation of what's later known to be the Red Dead franchise. But it's not always like that. Back then, it wasn't even a Rockstar title, but an arcade shooter published by Capcom. So ladies, gents, trans people, lost media, and western enthusiasts, welcome to Red Dead Revolver, the Capcom game that once was. You know, maybe I should start making a series about cancelled games and betas that were vastly different and call it the games that once was, so to speak, yeah? I'll work on the title, but uh... But before we get to that... Raid Shadow Legends! <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a small company known as Angel Studios, founded by Colombian artist Diego Angel in San Diego, California. His studio is famous for its CG and films and some music videos for most of its early life in the 1980s. The studio will be later known when they shift their focus on games in the mid-90s, such as Smuggler's Run, Mr. Bones, Midtown Madness, King Griffey Jr. Slugfest, and of course Midnight Club. Then across the Pacific Ocean, we have Yoshiki Okamoto, a famed Japanese game designer who worked on some well-known arcade titles for Capcom, such as 1942, Final Fight, Street Fighter 2, and some small PS1 survival horror game called Biohazard. But to the rest of the world, because copyright reasons, it's also known as... Resident Evil. That game became a smash hit when it came out in 1996. Later on the same year, Capcom announced that Resident Evil is getting a sequel, directed by Hideki Kami and Shinji Mikami. That game in itself is an interesting story on its own, but we're focusing on the part that made Angel Studios famous as a game developer. The Nintendo 64 port. This port of Resi 2 was considered as a technical marvel in design. Many thought putting an FMV on Nintendo 64 hardware was impossible to put in for such a small cartridge let alone all 14 minutes worth. With the clever use of compression and optimization, the two-disc game was fitted down to a single 64 megabyte cartridge. The only other game on the console that has FMV was Pokemon Puzzle League, but that only had 30 seconds worth of footage in a puzzle game. In 1997, Okamoto resigned from Capcom and founded his own company called Flagship. Then around 1998, he was impressed by Angel Studios from their efforts on porting Resident Evil 2 to the console where only a few RPGs existed. He approached them with a pitch document and be like, Hey, that Resi 2 game you ported on Nintendo? I never thought you pulled it off. So I got an idea for you that would sell like gangbusters. He slapped down the pitch document on Diego's table, and on the cover reveals the title. SWAT. SWAT was planned to be a single-player split-screen game where you control your four-man group of the SWAT to take on bad guys. Coincidentally, this game is quite similar to Higher Guns on the Amiga, developed by DMA Design. That was the initial intention, but how did a tactical game like SWAT become a third-person western shooter like Red Dead? This curious change has to involve Okamoto after watching a western called Blind Man, starring Ringo Starr from the Beatles. Another reason is that he kind of wanted to make a spiritual sequel to a game he worked on, the 1985 top-down shooter Gunsmoke, or Gun.Smoke as the title suggested. So they ditched the SWAT team idea and spun this into a codename for a third-person shooter as Spaghetti Western Action Team. Mr. San Diego Angel was definitely on board on this, and he'd be like, well fuck yeah, let's do this. And thus, a spiritual successor to Gunsmoke, not Sunset Riders as said on the other video, was born. And its name? Red Dead Revolver. Another man who was included in the project is Akira Yasuda, aka Akiman. Famous for designing characters for Street Fighter 2, Marvel vs. Capcom, and Bodacious Space Pirates. He was hired for the team as the game's lead character designer. Now there's one company I forgot to mention until now, Rockstar. 
The House of Houses need no introduction when I make a peep out of Grand Theft Auto. But we ain't talking about that, but the relationship with Angel Studios. They did publish a few Angel games in the past, such as Smokers Run and Midnight Club. But what makes this a tad special is Diego and the Hauser Boys became good friends from a shared love of tequila. No, really. Despite their friendship with alcohol, Diego was planning to sell his company around that time, and a few buyers were waiting. Mainly Microsoft and Activision. Now imagine the dark timeline on that if he sold his company to them. I'm looking at a dead man! Later on in 2002, Rockstar and Capcom went on to make some deals. Like Capcom had the Japanese publishing rights to GTA 3 and Vice City for one thing. And Rockstar's parent company, Take Two, acquiring Angel Studios for a good $34 million. Shortly after, Okamoto left Capcom, and Capcom was likely going to put the dead in Red Dead anyways, as it wasn't going to be finished without him or in the game's current state. Having a game being shafted is one thing, but when Angel was acquired by Rockstar, they gave the San Diego company a new name, purple attire, and scrapped the projects that went nowhere. The Houser Boys take a good look at the games in development, and one game that stood out from these projects was the Cowboy game, Red Dead Revolver and they said that the game looked pretty good. As they were told from Angel that it was an unplayable mess, the Housers gave the newly acquired studio another chance by giving them more creative control. Thus, the game's development was restarted and the rest you might say is history, right? But, a curious question remains. What would the Red Dead game be like IF it was released by Capcom? November 30th, 2020, we have an answer as an early prototype was dumped to the public. This was released by the same guy who claimed to dump the PS1 version of Superman in the fabled Resident Evil 1.5 prototype. The build date for Red Dead Revolver is from January 15th, 2002, a good two months before its official announcement. This can be known as the early Capcom build, or the SWAT version as seen in the game's ISO. This is the closest thing for beta to a major Rockstar title like acquiring the E3 build of GTA 3. Between the early development stages underneath the names of SWAT and Red Dead Revolver, there's a new discovery. The game was once going to be called The Last Gunman and Red Revolver, meaning that the dead part was later put in as either the story significance, or has a nice ring to it since it rhymes with red. According to Okamoto, this is Naoto Tomonagi's idea. Red Revolver seems kind of bland as the main character's gun isn't even red, and The Last Gunman seems either too generic or like the avoid lawsuit is from William W. Johnstone, the author of The Last Gunfighter series western novels. Either way, you prefer Tomonagi's idea, and be grateful that there's no red redemption on the later titles. I mean, it ain't the same without Dead, like a viper without the stripes. So in this video, we're going to take a good look at the game's levels, weapons, characters, and notably the gameplay. I will compare these with the final game for differences. If there's some spare time, I'll try to get into some miscellaneous content and try to grasp over the loose story. So let's begin. In this prototype, there's 11 playable levels, but there's a staggering 64 more which are inaccessible. This demo has a multiplayer mode too, but it only contains one level which is reused. The theme music for all of them is just a looping version of the theme song of Leone's For A Few Dollars More, composed by Neo Morricone. To save us the mercy from listening to a non-seamless loop of Morricone for god knows when, I got some soundtracks for other western games. The Red Dead soundtrack are all licensed, however, and I'm not planning on getting copyright striked over the same song shared with a Spongebob episode. Now let's look at the game, shall we? Training Stage Don't fret, the game didn't freeze if you select a level, but it lacks a loading screen. Yeah, it takes a long time to load a level without Red twirling his gun like an ocelot. But after it's loaded, you are greeted with two options, Basic Training or Shooting Challenge, instructed by this familiar man here. The environment is much different and is based off this piece of concept art shown. As the name suggested, this was the original tutorial level, 
The final game shows you the mechanics for the first few levels, instead of giving you everything at once. There's no way out of talking to him, but there's no punishment of leaving the intended place and explore the lake on the other side. There's some wreckage by said lake, meaning that it might connect to some unprogrammed gunfight as suggested by these holes in the walls. There's a bug here where you can softlock the game by pausing and unpausing during this small menu here. But then again, you can still restart the level or exit out of it. Fun fact! This backdrop didn't get cut after all. The camp area where you start was repurposed for a cutscene, and the main level itself was heavily reworked as a stealth level where you play as Shadow Wolf. Sadly, the river on the other side was cut. Prologue Stage This is an early version of the very first level of the game where you play as Young Red. The house is a bit cleaner looking. Some instances, plants and foliage placement are different, and the environment outside the house lacks a creek and firing range. You also get to fight enemies too, featuring ugly Chris's gang and Billy the Kid as some boss. This means that Red got to Billy before Pat Garrett did. No, the house isn't set on fire, but there's a woman and little girl running around in fear. Killing Chris's gang just gives you a thank you and directions on how to restart the level, so you can do it again. Title Stage Simply the second level and first where you play as a grown-up Red. But the thing here is that you're still young Red. This happens on all levels, besides this one. It starts with this old man selling you weaponry. After a quote-unquote buy-in because you got $10, you attempt to walk away because there's a twist. The shopkeeper is an asshole, and then goons came out of the woodwork, including one dressed in drag and a Frankenstein monster. The level lacks additional scenery, which the final version did as part of the cover mechanics. After killing these fools, you are interacted by this doggo friend here with no dialogue. One thing you need to point out is that there is no level ending. There could be, but all of them lack such a thing. And most of them lack dialogue text. In case you're wondering, the only level that actually ends in this demo was the training stage after completing the shooting challenge. Sheriff Knight This one is the nice stage of Widow's Patch, featuring this man who never made it to the final. He uses a rifle, rides a horse, and accompanies with shielded goons. Carlos is one Mr. Bullseye's name, and he has a neat trick which he bank shots you with his rifle. Also in the middle of this, there's a stone-faced hostage with a stick of dynamite over his ass. He tells you to follow him if you interact by pressing X, but it does nothing. Sheriff Day. It's the daytime version. Since Ugly Chris's gang isn't a factor here as you already killed them two levels ago, here's a couple waves of gunslingers and campers instead. Now I know what you're thinking. How will they fuck up the dueling mechanics? A good question, but disappointing answer. They didn't. Because there's no dueling. A better question is, when the dueling was implemented. Maybe not in this build. Alright, what's next? Besides Ugly Chris, how about Pig Josh and Stayed? Apparently, this is the only character with dialogue who sounds and looks a lot more intimidating and threatening than... You gonna blow up real good, cowboy! <laughs> also, his goons are different as they're not midget clown boys, but midget bat boys who chuck story knives at you. Very slow ones, in fact. Pig Josh also chucks dynamite at you, but the frame rate tanking particle effects just fucks with the sound so hard that the music lost sync. It's the hardest level by far, but this is the only one where you ever see the health pickups. But here's a fun fact. This town wasn't going to be Widow's Patch at one point, but known as Hell's Bend in the beta according to this sign. Saloon Stage This is shown in the E3 trailer, but there's practically nothing here apart from these two guys. I know this place for sure and this ain't some beta edition of the saloon from Brimstone, but the cut saloon in Widow's Patch has some sub-area. I have a theory. There could be some sort of deleted scene where Red goes to the saloon and try to get a drink after killing off a few goons. Some guy who was miffed challenged Red to a duel which leads to the first dueling section. The reason for this cut could be that this would take two whole loading screens just for this scene alone. A second theory here is that after facing off Pig Josh in the daytime, you head to the saloon to drink and rest, and then this leads to the night stage where you fight off Carlos. I'm grasping at straws here. Tombstone 
Yes, Tombstone was going to be the name instead of Brimstone. It is quite different. One of which is the lack of barriers, and in its place are invisible walls. Another is the lack of messages on doors of certain buildings, different NPCs, and trying to interact with certain folks will likely result in a gunfight. There's two major things. One of which is a bunch of posters of someone wants to be president, and one location that's missing is the bank. The town stores are rearranged. The missing bank was the gun store, the gun store was the clinic, the theater was the blacksmith, and the far left corner of town was going to be some Indian settlement, which later replaced with more buildings. The store in two years does exist, but one place that was cut entirely was the barber shop. It's likely going to be the same type of shop like the others, but with barber related things. Just to unlock more journal pages and some extra characters. Flashback stage. The famous snow level that was believed to be cut in the final game. Well, the level was actually repurposed as a showdown map, but minus the snow effects. This one here is where you simply approach this house, and a cutscene is played, showing said house exploding, and then Red got an arm cramp. If you're expecting some snow based adventure, I'm gonna say it's not. This is probably some cutscene only stage as the flashback title suggested, and there's nothing else outside of it. Train is a simple level, but with no enemies. That guy on the horse is just a dummy. I think this is a level that's barely started, and that one in question might be the railroaded chapter. This place in particular is likely where you fend off the horse riding bandits from robbing his train or something. Only difference is, one, the design, two, you're riding the horse chasing the train, and three, this out of place cannon. Note that there's only two train levels in the final. The one I didn't mention was the one you're riding the horse to stop the train so we can finish off General Diego. Fourth stage isn't much of a stage, but more like an unfinished boss room. I think the idea here is that one of the main villains sit on his throne with his minions around to watch the show. The things beside the throne are torches, a gong, some hanging cage, and in front of the throne is a better looking Gatling gun. The boss idea here from what I could picture is to run for cover behind one of these barriers when the boss is firing his Gatling gun until it jams. Another thing is that while pelting the boss with bullets, the goons will shoot you from above so you have to pick them off one by one. One thing I realized while recording this footage is that there's a stone carving of some man that we never saw in the game. I'm not sure about the villains in this version of Red Dead, but if Carlos and Billy the Kid was playing as bosses, then who was likely going to fit in this room? General Diego? Mr. Kelly? Colonel Darren? Or someone else that's never mentioned? Remains a mystery. Mansion. The governor's mansion is completely different, starting with a smaller house and courtyard design. The mansion doors had white accents, there are no tall hedges, there's a podium, and the missing bank and tombstone is right here, shutting out like a sore thumb. The fun thing is that you can exit the place and explore the low LOD version of Tombstone at your own leisure. No invisible walls necessary. Sadly, no interiors for the mansion, but you can explore the rooftops as the game spawns you there. This looks like a bland finale, but I feel like this was going to be used for some cutscene, and the final level was something different than that. Or this could end with the last duel against Governor Griffin, negating the siege in the mansion altogether. You wouldn't believe how much of a pain in the ass that siege level was. That's all the 11 playable stages, and what I've said before, there's 64 more that were unused in this build. I would show you, but unfortunately I'm not that person to mess around with game code. Somebody would though, and there are screenshots from the cutting room floor that shows the unused levels. Let's get into those. The Cutting Room Floor is one of my favorite websites to go to. It's fascinating just to look at stuff in games that was never used like cut levels, characters, music, dialogue, sound effects, scripts, etc. Unfortunately, the article for this prototype remains unfinished, and there's some things I can't do like actually accessing one of the 64 cut levels. I'm just gonna make assumptions through these screenshots. Level AI looks like it's barely started. Featuring a barn that's textured while everything else is in plaid. I'm gonna take a far out guess that this ends up being the Range War level where you play as Annie Stokes in the final. As this barn had a familiar layout inside. The two buildings I don't know what they represent, 
and the lack of shading doesn't help either. According to its level file, there's supposed to be a bank and general store just sitting there. Level Bridge is definitely a very early version of the Traitor chapter where you play as General Diego. While the previous may have textures, this one lacks such a thing, apart from this bridge, the water, and the walls. The other things that lacked are cannons, debris, and of course enemies, like most levels here. Level Core is the most finished from the bunch, shown on TCRF. It's the mine level from the final game but with some differences. The core part is at the end of the mine level where you fought off the brothers Ted and Tony. The level also contained two extras, Core K and Core Multi, which could mean that Core K is just some sub area, or part 2, and Core Multi could be the multiplayer variant. Level MSN, aka Mission, is a completely cut level in the final game. You ride on the horse in the sunset chasing the wagon through some section of the desert. Some details include the low LOD of Widow's Patch, yellow debug lines representing the AI path, and according to TCRF, shooting the horses crashed the game. Oh, and you can destroy the wagon too. In the final game, you do ride a horse in the sunset, gunning down the wagon where the shotgun is actually useful for once. Difference being is that this takes place in some canyon, not outside of Widow's Patch. Those are just a mere portion of the levels shown on TCRF. The ones I didn't mention in the article are just test levels for the most part. There's plenty more outside of what the article's shown, but some of these lack details in their level files which can be opened on Notepad. It's unknown if you need these certain files plus their models or what have you just to get it working, since most of the entire game's assets are contained inside SWAT.zip, which I'll get into later. Characters in Red Dead's beta contain a staggering 40 playable characters in Showdown mode, but in the retail release contain 48. That sounds like it had less characters, but there's actually several in the prototype who are playable here and not in the final. Also not in the final game is that you can pick your weapons and special abilities, some of them at least. Apparently I don't know the abilities myself apart from the quick draw, but I think they're not finished. Unfortunately, there's no character banters, Jack Swift, and only contain one map, which could be monotonous against a single opponent. But the characters themselves, plenty of them have radically different designs shown in the final version. I'm not planning on analyzing all 40 playable characters, but I want to look at some which are the most interesting. Bad Boy is an unused enemy in the retail release who had the ability to glide. As seen in the Pig Josh fight, he was meant to be one of Josh's goons who could fly by the explosions. In the final, these were replaced by midget clowns instead. Carlos is a notable unused boss who was meant to be in the night version of Ghost Town, but replaced by Professor Perry. This I believe isn't cut, but redesigned as the hapless Sheriff O'Grady. Oddly, the multiplayer version lacks his face for some reason. Guardians are an unused shield enemy type in the final. The shield does nothing in multiplayer, but the character could possibly be a beta version of Atlas Jones, who is the only one in the final game to ever use a shield. Billy Kid appeared as some boss in the prologue stage as Billy the Kid. His design is much different than the final version, who is Kid Cougar. The one we got is based off Leonardo DiCaprio from Sam Raimi's The Quick and the Dead. Franken is huge, had green skin and patches all over. Also, he has two bottom teeth sticking out. This is an early version of George Little Oaf Whitney. Sadly, he's one of the final version's non-playable multiplayer characters. In the single player here, he's called Big Oaf. Ginny is the young girl who doesn't seem to appear outside of this build. She only appeared in the prologue. Mexican, M Indian, Tall Guy, and Soldier are the only characters that crushed the game. This is likely due to their assets don't exist here. This title is likely short for Young Red's Master. He is meant to be a good guy but ended up as a boss for Shadow Wolf's level as Grizzly. This could be a piece of unexplained lore as Red was going to be trained by him shown in the training level. Plaid Guy could be a cut character. Like the name suggests, he wore plaid. Shop Owner is a beta Curly Shaw. He appeared to be an enemy in the title stage and wears glasses, I think. He also appeared in Tombstone as a friendly. Could be emulation issues, but he is kinda transparent. 
There are two characters labeled as ZZ Top, named after the front man of the same name. These are just the chunky sombrero guys you'll see in the final game. The next one is a baby. The retail version had children, only a few. But the baby in question didn't make the cut. Strangely, this one's playable, and it looks silly when you run around as a floating potato blasting with a shotgun with telekinesis. The last one is Red himself. In the final game you can play as two different Reds in multiplayer, the adult and his younger counterpart. In the prototype you can play as four of them. The new Red is the one we recognized in the final, albeit looked a bit older and his hair isn't as spiky. The trading and snow versions are the young Red who doesn't resemble Red Jr. One of them could be reused as a newspaper boy Jody. The next one is just Red, and he stands out where he's blonde, sports a blue handkerchief, a worn down hat, and the red bandana on his hands showing out a lot more. Could this be the original Red in the early SWAT version? Or someone else entirely? Maybe I'll get to that later. During development of the early version of Red Dead Revolver, the gameplay is different, much different, comparing to the one we got. You could still take cover, run around, climb onto objects, etc. The core shooting is kind of like Goldeneye, except you can move around while aiming and you can jump instead of rolling. You could also disarm enemies by shooting at their weapons, and the Deadeye doesn't slow down time. It also had a timer likely set for most or all levels. In the early trailer it was counted down, suggesting that each mission will be set on a strict time limit. In this build there's only a whopping 6 weapons to choose from. A pistol, double gun, shotgun, rifle, throwing knife, and dynamite. Seems like a weak lineup, but the knife and dynamite are quite useless in my opinion. In the final game there are 28, and most of them can be upgraded. The shotgun had better range, but the fire rate is garbage. The rifle only had one shot until reload, and the pistols are generally weak. A fun thing is that you can exploit the ammo count by letting go and draw again, instantly reloads your guns. Fighting off bad guys can be monotonous as usual, but the real enemy here are the controls. And my god, the guys from San Diego are right. The game controls like dog shit. It's hard to describe these controls, but if you expect to be like in Red Dead Redemption, or in this case, Revolver, then that's wrong. Trying to aim can be a chore as the camera points to the direction of your character when aiming. And even that doesn't work right. Not to mention, moving forward along with moving the camera left or right doesn't work as it should be. Not to mention, do you think killing enemies are easy? Well, sometimes yeah, but sometimes they have this stun animation which goes on for too long than it should. This doesn't only apply to enemies, but you too. Oh, even when they're stunned, you can't really hurt them until they get back up. Shooting them in the back makes you think it deals more damage as you're not in the enemy's sight, right? Nope, it deals even less damage from what I tried. The HUD itself could be very annoying, especially the unnecessarily big ammo count taking a good chunk of the screen. The later Capcom build had a much different HUD, but that one's much busier, with a large chunk that takes both top and bottom ends of the screen. Like the guys from Angel Studios said earlier, the gameplay shown in the trailers are heavily programmed, hence there's nothing much to do except bask in its unfinished glory. I mentioned about the level files in the unused levels chapter, but to give you some context. Inside the ISO for the beta lies within the zip file called SWAT, the game's original name. Inside SWAT.zip reveal more secrets. But this isn't any usual zip file which you can open with 7-zip. Special thanks to Marugo on GitHub who made a Python script to extract the zip's contents, so I can dig deep and found some text files. This one in particular is called SWAT.txt. This format looks like this is meant for some Excel document according to its weird structure. But it shows you some shit. Including a script. The loose story inside is only shown in dialogue. There are text strings where it implies that you can kick down doors, more tutorial bollocks, 
barely put together stealth. One thing I was wrong is that they did have dueling implemented, but it was never used here. The text also gives you tutorials on how to use the abilities, like Carlos Ricochet Shots. Howdy. My name's Carlos, and I'm the sheriff around these parts. Now then, I'm going to show you just why I'm sheriff. Old Betsy here, she ain't much to look at, but she's got a real nice trick. The dancing bullet. To do the dancing bullet is simple. First, draw your gun. Then move your aiming cursor up, down, then up again, real quick like. You should see a line indicating that you're ready to fire the dancing bullet. When you got a lock on your target, fire. <laughs> Walls aren't the only thing you can bounce bullets off of. If you have the right partner, you can use them for your dancing bullet. That's all there is to it. Remember to keep your eye out for that indicator line, cause you never know when. <laughs> this would imply that Red would not only have dead eye, but many abilities for certain kinds of weapons. The dancing bullet is an ability for the rifle, but what other abilities are there? In the beta showdown mode, there's counterattack, dinobar, and ghost. Deadeye isn't going to be just Deadeye, but as Spinfire. So, four abilities in total. I don't know how to use the extra abilities in question, but I try them out in showdown mode by wildly making weird combinations. The Dynamar ability I did perform, but I don't know how to use that. The Ghost ability doesn't make you invisible, but lets out a smokescreen. One thing can't perform at all with the counter ability. The other abilities in showdown mode aren't much. One is that you glide, but all I can do is jump higher with the bat boy. And one more is supposedly a super tackle and super armor, which gives the player extra protection I think. In the .swui, or SWAT UI files, there's actually 11. I already mentioned most of them, but there's also glide attack and crazy horse. Glide attack may be one of the bat boy's second ability where they chuck throwing knives at you while gliding. But Crazy Horse, on the other hand, could be, and I'm guessing, throw homing knives at their opponents. Or something related to the shotgun. Then the next part lies in the dot vag files. You be like, Mace, there's only four vagina files and half of them are for the right channel. Nuh uh. In the swat.zip, there's more than that. 273 exactly. There's plenty of sounds supposedly related to certain characters. One of the most notable quotes are whistling and saying lock on. 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 Or mentioning that they're blinded. No story element, sadly. Oddly, I thought these voice clips aren't used, but apparently they are in this build. My vision. Nothing much more to note about. There's some animation files which I don't have the software to use since they're all in these files here, plus a couple more variants. Just special animations for certain characters, bosses, and a group of file names that has SWAT into them. Like I said before in the unused levels, I don't have the coding wizardry to get these working. I could show you some of the VAG files and some graphics, but, but what will be interesting is the story. Red Dead's story in its release is a more straightforward spaghetti western tale of a bounty hunter on a journey to avenge his folks from the men they killed. Sounds a bit quaint compared to its sequels, right? Then again, its beta story would have been much different. Red was planned to have a wide range of special attacks besides the Deadeye after defeating certain bosses. I don't know much about the original plot, I'm taking assumptions at this point. Even looking through this lengthy Polygon article about the development of Red Dead didn't give me much of a clue to work with. Well, story-wise. 
The best source of what would vaguely describe Capcom's version of Red Dead story is in a video by People Make Games with ex-employee of Rockstar, Dominic Craig, which is where I got some of the info from. The game's story is heavily based around on old westerns, notably Clint Eastwood's High Plains Drifter. Red's name wasn't exactly known as Red Harlow, but a nickname as Red Hand, which he has a burnt hand wrapped around a red bandana. In an early draft of the story, he was planned to be killed with his family at the start of the game, who will be returned from the afterlife to take revenge from those who killed them. The notorious outlaws throughout the final game are not just regular bounties initially, but instead some of the ones evolved to your death, which you ought to take vengeance. The train level shown in the beta was originally going to be something out of Mario, featuring a Gatling gun, cannons, a heart-shaped train car, and a princess. Now you see this blonde red I showed you earlier? This I believe was the red who got killed, then later came back as the one we recognize in the main game. This mirrors High Plains Drifter, where Clint Eastwood's character was out to avenge the death of a marshal, but it's implied at the end he is the same marshal who came back from the grave to settle his personal vendetta, but that remains disputed. That may be far-fetched, but another thing that comes to mind when I got some Gunsmoke footage was that Blonde Red loosely resembles Billy Bob, Gunsmoke's protagonist. Proof shows in an arcade flyer where he sports lighter clothing and a blue handkerchief, but he has brown hair. But, it could also be a mix between that and the other cover arts and concept art shown. I'm gonna guess that the spiritual Gunsmoke successor still remains in the beta's DNA still. When Rockstar got the rights to Red Dead Revolver, three months after Capcom cancelled it, the San Diego company got to rework the game with the assets they got, and then managed to finish it and release it on May 4th, 2004. There are changes to the game that I wouldn't go deep into, but the HUD is more cleaner, gameplay is more of a traditional shooter with some variety, wacky character designs are toned down to be more cohesive and Rockstar-like, and stories definitely changed. Oh yeah, the controls are much better, which is the first thing they worked on when development restarted. Even though the game finally saw the light of day, the developers had little to no hopes for it to succeed, let alone a follow-up. The final game received mixed reviews, an average of 73 on Metacritic, and sold well over 140,000 on the first week, and then later 920,000 copies in its lifespan. To the surprise of many, there's going to be a sequel. In E3 2005, Rockstar made a tech demo slash teaser dubbed as Old West Project, running on a fancy new game engine called Rage. A curious reason why Rockstar bought Angel Studios was one, their relationship with its tequila loving founder, and two, their game engine, which is what Rage is based off of. Because the Criterion Renderware engine used for the whole majority of console games was about to be bought by EA, and Rockstar ain't having that shit. Anyways, this Old West project was planned to be a direct sequel to Revolver, but that didn't go anywhere. And so they made a new story standing at the end of the Wild West, starring another badass gunslinger and facial scar enthusiast, John Marston. This would soft reboot the franchise and call the Old West project under a new name, Red Dead Redemption. And you want to know one more crazy fact? Despite Red Dead Revolver was going to be planned to be published by Capcom, the final Japanese version did get published by them. You may be like, wait, what? Until I have to bring up that despite Rockstar allowed Capcom to publish GTA in Japanese shores, but that's not the only Rockstar games that could do that. So in some sense, Red Dead got published by Capcom in the end. Surprisingly, you can still play Red Dead Revolver on the PS3 and PS4, and on its own, it's a solid western with some good gameplay, a simple story, and a multiplayer mode that would be fun with a few friends. Its sequels are a different beast entirely, setting the world on fire from each release, even when the Medal of Time was spent on making an immense amount of detail. But one thing you should remember is that, without Red Dead Revolver, there won't be any redemption. Anyways, what else should I cover? And I'm not talking about the ones everyone in their cat already knows, like Beta Mario 64, but lesser known games or even cancelled games like that Twitch Metal Harbor City I made two videos about. Throw some games down in the comments and I'll be happy to look for it. <laughs>